Where we last left off in the study, <clears throat> we noticed that Leah began to have children and she had four sons in succession. She had Reuben, she had Simeon, Levi, and Judah. As we enter into chapter 30, we're going to see the reaction that Rachel had to the fact that her sister Leah is bearing children. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I die. Well, that's, you know, I mean, what can, what can he do about that? You know, she's not having children. Basically, the problem was, is that as Jacob was noticing that Leah was having children easily, and uh, his wife, uh, Rachel, was not, it appears that he was spending a little bit of time, maybe a little bit more time, over there with uh, Leah than he was with Rachel. And Rachel was getting upset, and she also was not bearing a child, and so she gets upset and she says, you need to give me children. I need to have a child or else I'm going to just die. Well, Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and he said to her, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? He said, it's not my fault that you're not having children. I can't make you have a baby if you can't conceive. So she said, here's my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife, and Jacob went in to her. Now what she meant by that she may bear a child on my knees is, in other words, she will have a child in my place. And there is evidence that perhaps she had, uh, it, there was a custom in, in the times of the, uh, of the writing of this passage that they would actually give birth with the woman uh, holding her handmaiden on her lap. And it would be a symbolic act of the handmaiden having a child for her, for her uh, mistress. And that's a basic statement, though. What she's saying is, she can have the child in, instead of me, and that child will be my child. So Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan, and that name means judge. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed, I have prevailed. Now this is an indication of the relationship and the stress that's involved in the relationship. With great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali, which means my wrestling. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. Now Jacob's having all kinds of women in his life now. All kinds of children are being born to him. It's really an incredible thing to be an object like that of these women, intense uh, competition, this competitive spirit. And according to their customs, it was acceptable for him to, uh, to have children through another woman other than his wife. But it wasn't God's plan. And you see the strife that's involved in something like this. So here, here comes Leah again. She takes Zilpah, her maid, and, he gave, and uh, gave her to Jacob as wife. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. And then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad, which literally means troop. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I'm happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher which means happy. Now Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Now Reuben was the firstborn son of Leah and he was probably around seven years old at this time. And he'd gone out into the field and he found mandrakes. Mandrakes were also called uh, love apples. They were recognized as being, superstitiously recognized as being um, aphrodisiacs. Uh, that the people who ate these believed that they would become fertile if they ate them. And um, so here's uh, Rachel, and she sees that she's not having children, and she says, Le sees Leah, who has had children. 
and immediately she wants to make a, you know, a deal for those. She wants to have those mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you, would have take, that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. So she made a deal for these. She figured that if she were to be able to take of these mandrakes, she herself would get fertile. And so she was willing to give up her husband for a night to her sister. Incredible. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And this is an evil. This is an evil thing to do. This is sexual bargaining. I bought you. You belong to me. It's a form of... Uh, it, it's unfortunate that they got into this kind of uh, relationship. But she came out, and I'm certain that she had prettied herself up, and she said, hey, you know, you're mine tonight, big guy, and that's what's going to happen. <laughs> so off they go. Now God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Issachar means reward. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I've borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Zebulun means habitation. She thinks that having all these children is going to cause her husband to have his heart knit together to hers. And so she says, my husband will dwell with me. I've borne him six sons. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Dinah means judgment, and you're going to see something in the life of Dinah in chapter 34. But this is their first daughter. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Now, this was four years after she had made a bargain for those mandrakes. You know, so obviously those mandrakes did her no good. Four years later, in God's timing, in her life, she's going to conceive and have a child. So she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph, which means may he add, and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Now that's an incredible thing. That's, an, that's a statement of faith. God's going to give me another son. I've already had this one, and she's already expecting God to bless her again, which he does. He gives her another son by the name of Benjamin. We'll see that later on. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children. Now, by this time, he's got 11 sons and a daughter. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go. For you know my service, which I have done for you. And it's time for him to go home and he wants to leave. He asks for his children and his wives, and he says, it's time for me to go. But Laban said to him, please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. You know, I really do believe that the Lord blesses others for the sake of certain who love him. I believe that one of the reasons that the United States has not come into judgment yet, and one of the reasons that the United States is a blessed and prosperous nation by and large is because of the fact that God is blessing the United States for the fact that he has children here. He's got a church here, a church that uh, may not be the most powerful church in the world, but is a church nonetheless, a church that is growing in terms of its experience, in terms of the desire to serve him. And I believe that God has kept his hands on the United States basically because we have honored him. And I'm not saying that we are the most blessed nation just because there are Christians here, but I believe that God blesses because of, of believers being involved, and this is what's taking place. Jacob has learned, uh, Laban has learned that. Laban has learned by experience that the Lord has blessed him for the sake of Jacob. So he says, I've learned this. He says, name, your, name me your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you have uh, for what you had before I came was little, and it is now increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now when shall I also provide for my own house? So he said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall give me nothing. Y you can't give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. 
Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it's with me. And Laban said, Oh, that it were according to your word. It appears that the stronger cattle that Laban possessed were the solids. And it appears that Jacob is making a bad deal for himself. He says, I'll just take the spotted ones. I'll take the speckled ones. It appears that the dominant colorings were dark or solid. So Laban hears this deal being made, and Laban thinks it's a great deal. He says, good. He says, I like that idea. Sure, take them. They're yours. Because he figures he's not going to lose anything in this deal, and he thinks he's ripped off his son-in-law again. He'd already told him to name his wages before and ended up getting 14 years of service out of him instead of the seven that he had agreed upon. So he feels that this is a good deal here, and so he says, oh, let it be according to your word. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days' uh, journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. So Laban went in there, did all the removing himself. He didn't trust Jacob enough to let him do it. He did it himself, and he put about 60 miles between the two flocks. Now, Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them, and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. <laughs> Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. There's a lot of questions about why he, you know, had this, these rods peeled and why the stripes and all. And there's not a real answer. You, you, you know, it's been said that he may have been um, superstitious, which I, I don't believe. I don't think that was a superstitious thing. It appears that uh, what he did for himself is he made it the hardest thing possible for God to bless, just in order for Laban to see the hand of the Lord in this. These, these, uh, he should not have prospered. He should not have had all these flocks. He should have immediately have reduced anything that he could possibly have had, and instead of that, God blessed this. And I think this is just an uh, opportunity for us as we read the Scriptures to see how that God goes beyond that which is logical and blesses in order to show himself strong. And it's been said that when he uh, put this stuff in the water that he may have been creating an aphrodisiac, something that would cause the, uh, the animals to desire to, to breed. But that's all, you know, just there are too many people who don't understand this particular passage. I look at it as just being an indication of God's grace where uh, Jacob was blessed in spite of all logic and in spite of what should have occurred logically. And it was just the hand of the Lord involved in this as he, God, blessed Jacob. Now in, verse, in chapter 31, Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. And from what was our father's, he's acquired all his wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it wasn't favorable towards him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock and said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not favorable toward me as before. 
But the God of my father has been with me, and you know that with all my might I have served your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he had said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Now, Laban was a dishonest man. I told you he had his PhD in sneakiness. And he was a dishonest man. So he started seeing that um, Jacob was being blessed with all these cattle. So he said, you can only have the streaked. And then it turns out that all the cattle that are being born are streaked. So he says, you can only have the speckled. Then it turns out that all of them are being speckled. This is why I say the hand of the Lord was involved in this, and it wasn't something that Jacob was doing. Now, it appears also that Rachel and Leah hadn't been notified by Jacob that Laban was a ripoff. And this it appears to be the first time he's ever just telling his wives how his father-in-law is mistreating him. And he tells them, you're dad. He's ripped me off ten times. He keeps changing my wages on me. He said, it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. So they looked at what their father Laban had done. Remember how that Laban had brought Leah and tricked Jacob into line with her and then tricked him into all these years of service. Well, the daughters hadn't, hadn't uh, lost. Um, they, it wasn't something that passed by them. They had seen it happen and they knew that, uh, that their father was a ripoff. And they said, you know, my dad's not only ripping you off, but when he rips you off, he's ripping us off. And when he rips us off, he's also ripping off his own grandchildren. He said, so, they said, so we understand your position and go for it. Whatever the Lord's told you, we're behind you. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels, and he carried away all his livestock. He drove away all of his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained, his acquired livestock which he had gained in... Uh, Padan Aram, which is Mesopotamia, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. The household idols are good luck idols. And for some reason, Rachel thought it would be good for her to take these idols with her. And so she goes on in and she takes the idols. But that little thievery is going to cost him a little problem here. Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river, the river Euphrates, and headed toward the mountains of Gilead, which was about 300 miles southwest of them. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey, and he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. And so Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? that you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and songs and timbrel and harp. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do you harm. That was a lie. 
What he's doing right now is bluffing. He was so mad that he wouldn't even stop to rest. He drove on for a week to catch them. They were already six days' journey ahead of him. But because there were a lot of flocks and small children, they were not making good time. The minute Laban had heard that they had taken off on him, he was so angry that he got some of his men, jumped on their horses or camels or whatever, and off they went, and they pursued him hard. They finally caught up to him when they were in Gilead. He said, now we've got him. What we're going to do now is we're going to rest overnight, and tomorrow we're going to go take care of business. So that's how Laban went to sleep, expecting to deal harshly the next day with Jacob. But that night in a dream, God said, you better not speak to him, even speak to him wrongly. So Laban comes and he says, why have you done this thing? Why have you stolen my children and my grandchildren? You didn't even give me a chance to bless them. I would have given you a party and had to sent you out. That's a lie. He wouldn't have done that. He said, I just sent you out with joy, with timbrel and song. But you've snuck away. He said, and I have the power to do something to you. And he had no power. God had said, don't even talk to him harshly, let alone touch him. So he's bluffing. He's bluffing here. It is in my power to do you harm. It is not in his power to do anything. So he finally kind of confesses, though. He says, this is my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. You know, whenever anybody is talking to you and they're saying something to you, when they use the word but, that negates everything they've said up to that point. Have you ever had anybody walk up to you and tell you some things? They'll be saying a whole lot of things and then they'll say but. Generally, they do that with compliments. They'll be going, you know, you are the nicest person I've ever met. And I just love the way you do things. You know, you've got the nice but, and then you hear it, you know, and then they just rip you up. It's the but that negates everything out. They might as well not even say anything. Because that word but negates everything they've said up to that point. So everything he's saying up to here is negated by the fact that God said, you can't do anything. You can't touch him. Be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. And now, you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? That's a good question. Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid... For I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. Now that's the reason he stole away. But now he's going to deal with the question about the gods. With whomever you find your gods, do not let them live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. You know, she'd been with her husband for many years. Many years. And she still hadn't learned that those household gods weren't of any value. It's funny how that you can be involved with somebody in a dating relationship or married to them, and they still carry little um, portions of their prior religious concepts, and sometimes they hide them from you, and you don't even know it. You know, when I was dating Marie, my wife, my wife and I met, I was teaching in a, Bi a Bible study at my brother's house, and my brother worked at Sears here in Pomona. I lived in Norwalk, and I'd drive to Ontario, where my brother lived, every Monday night to teach him a Bible study. He'd gotten saved, and, uh, and my sister Madeline and I knew that Frank needed to have Bible teaching. So what we'd do is on Monday nights, my sister Madeline and I would come to my brother's house here in Ontario on D Street, and we'd teach him a Bible study, just Frank. Well, my brother started growing a little bit, and he, had, he started inviting people to his house for Bible study. After about um, two months, I think, uh, it was, I started teaching in September, so it was in November. A couple months, my wife Marie showed up. Now, of course, that was the first time I met her, and we talked and all, and I asked her, when did you become a Christian? She said she'd been a Christian all her life, and I knew that she wasn't saved. So we started talking, and within a month and a half, my wife had gotten saved, and then we started dating. Now, she was in Bible study with me every Monday night. Besides that, she went to church with me every Sunday. And for a full year, she was involved with me in ministry. My wife has always been involved with me in ministry. For a full year. One day, I was going through her wallet, looking to see how many pictures she carried of me in it. <laughs> and I discovered that she had the picture of another man in there. And I said, what are you doing carrying this picture of St. Joseph? <laughs> See, my wife was from the Catholic background, 
and she carried this little saint in her wallet. Now, I never told her that that wasn't a good idea. She knew that there's only one God and only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. But for some reason, she felt comfortable carrying that little picture of Joseph in her wallet. I never told her to take it out. I told her, you know that Jesus is your mediator. And I let it go at that. She took it out on her own. It was something she'd had for years that was given to her, that had precious value to her. But it's an interesting thing to me how that will hold fast to facets of our old life without even considering the relevance to them in the present. And it's interesting to me to see that Rachel was willing to steal household gods, good luck charms, when she'd seen God bless all these years. And yet sometimes we do that. Sometimes we hold on to things. Rachel, for some reason, had stolen them. Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the two maids' tents, but he didn't find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. And uh, he's, he's given it a thorough searching. Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel saddle and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent but didn't find them. She said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is with me. In other words, she was uh, menstruating, and she said, You've got to forgive me for not standing at this time. And he let her sit, and he searched, but he didn't find the household idols. Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban, and Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren, that they may judge between us both. These 20 years I've been with you. 20 years. Remember that originally his mother had said, just go for a few days, and when your brother's temper has cooled down, I'll call you back, and you can come on back home. It's been 20 years, and as far as he knows, Esau is still angry at him. It's been 20 years. And this is something that you need to keep in mind as we see what happens to him in the near future. 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts, I did not bring it to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the, day that, in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus I have been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you've changed my wages 10 times. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Now that's heavy. How many times we've felt like telling somebody off and we don't know how? This is a good indication of how you deal with conflict. You just tell the truth. And he's telling the truth. He's telling them what you did. This is what you've done. The reason I ran off on you is simple. I figured you'd send me off empty-handed. You've been ripping me off 20 years. You ripped me off 14 years for your two daughters. You ripped me off six years for the flock. He says, I've been a good servant to you. He said, I've taken care of it. I've, I, if, if anything in your flock was ripped up, I bore the brunt of it. Someone stole something, I took care of it. I took it out of my own wages. Never. I want to, to deal with you. And I do believe that God deals for us in our cases. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense. And God does. God deals with it. Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters. These children are my children. And this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have borne? So he didn't repent. You know, there are times that you will confront somebody. Man, I've done this before, and it's, it's really an incredible thing. When you do confront somebody, and you do present them with the facts, they hear the facts, they know they're guilty of what has been said, and they don't repent. 
they just immediately go right back to their argument that they've been stating just before. You say, but you blew it, man. You did this, you did this, and you did this. And it's like they don't even hear what you're saying. And that's what happens. The hearts are so hard. They're not willing to repent. They're not willing to hear. They're not willing to change. And because of that, he didn't even listen. And that's what will happen. So you have to tell the truth regardless of whether people listen or not. You've got to tell the truth whether people listen or not. Now, therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob, Jacob called it Galid, which means a heap of witness. And Laban said, this heap, of, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was called Galid. And also Mizpah, because he said, may the, now this is interesting, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. Now, doesn't that sound nice? May the Lord watch between thee and me when we're absent from each other. You would think that that, that would be a blessing that you would give to a close friend. You know what he was saying? He's saying, man, you're so sneaky. May God keep a 24-hour watch in your life. Because I can't trust you. And that was really a curse. May God watch you. Now, this is Laban actually saying this to Jacob. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with me. See, with a see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, here is this heap and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. Then Laban re departed and returned to his place. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Now he's coming out of the frying pan into the fire. This guy is under stress, incredible stress. He hasn't been home in 20 years. He's got to sneak away. He has got to sneak away from where he's been for the last 20 years, and he was pursued for seven days until he was caught. He went through the stress of having to deal with an irate father-in-law, and now he's home. Now, you would think that he'd be happy, but you know he had never received word from his mother that Esau's temper had cooled. And as far as he knows, the last time he heard from Esau, Esau was comforting himself with thoughts of killing him. And that's the last time he heard about his brother Esau. So he has gone from one man who wanted to do him a job into one, his own brother, who has been comforting himself as far as he knows with, his own, with the thought of killing his own brother. So God meets him in angels. He sends angels to meet him, and I'm certain they brought him comfort. When God saw them, he said, when uh, Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which means uh, uh, double camp, speaking of the camp of angels and his own camp that he brought. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir. Seir is uh, just south of the Dead Sea the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. Now what he was trying to do is he was trying to tell his brother, I'm coming home. And I have absolutely no need of any of the valuables you possess. I've got enough myself. Send him word and let him know. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. 
Now that isn't comforting news. You know, you know he by himself, Esau was a wild man. And what kind of men could he bring with him? And so, you know, this concerned him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Now he had forgotten, though, something important, that God had just recently delivered him from another man who wanted to kill him. But you see, God has to work with us constantly to remind of, us of his presence and his promises. God has to constantly do that with us because we forget. We forget quickly. We forget easily. Our eyes are always focused on the circumstances. And God is constantly having to renew his promises to us and his provision. So immediately, even though God has done a marvelous work, he begins to fear. He was afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. He said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will deal well with you. I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you've shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. I believe that there's a proper time to recount the promises of the Lord. I believe that there's a proper way of reminding God of what he has said. It isn't an arrogance that sometimes is attached to speaking to the Lord and speaking about his promises, but it's a humbleness. And in 20 years, I think God has done some work in the heart of this man, and he's coming to the point now of recognizing how good the Lord is. He said, God, you promised me that you would take care of me, and I really need you to take care of me. He says, I, you know, God, you know, think about this in your own life. Lord, we started out. We started out with nothing, and you've blessed us so much. One of the beautiful things in our life as a, as a small church here that has been a blessing to me is to realize that when we started out as a church, we had nothing at all, just a house to meet in. We didn't even have bulletins. We had nothing. And the Lord has added to us in the last three years many things. And I think it's good to remember what God has done in the last three years. Sometimes you forget. You know, this little building that we meet in on Sunday nights is nothing to some people who have large cathedrals, but to us, it's everything that God gives. It's a blessing. And as I realize that God has put into this something that, that, you know, we never had to beg for, but he gave to us willingly, it's a blessing to me. And I need to be reminded of the promises and blessings of God sometimes. And that's what he's doing now. He's remembering what God has done. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. He gave them 580 animals. It's a lot of animals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong and where are you going? Though, whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he, is also, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second and third and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So what he's doing is he's basically approaching his brother, and hopefully by giving him presents will demonstrate to him that he truly is not after his wealth or his power. And he's given him these gifts. Hopefully his brother will see these gifts arriving and will 
have a visual aid in recognizing that his brother Jacob is not after him in any sense of the word or desiring anything that he possesses. He gave him 580 animals. That's a lot of animals. That's a very large amount of animals to give away as a gift. And so he's hoping this will indicate to him his sincerity. So he rose that night and he took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. The ford of Jabbok is the ford of the wrestler. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone. And this is where he needs to be, and this is where we as Christians need to be. We need to be alone with God. He has had a real hard time of it. God has been dealing in this man for 20 years. And I believe that when God deals with you, it comes to a head sooner or later. And this is his time. I want you to notice some things that happened to him that night. It says, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is that? Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. <coughs> Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. I wonder what Jacob was praying about that night. I wonder what his prayers centered on. I wonder if he was asking God for victory in a battle. I wonder if he was wrestling first, I think, in his in his heart. I wonder where he was spiritually and emotionally in this crisis. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that the Bible does not say Jacob wrestled with this man, which I believe this man to be Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, but that the man wrestled with him. Very often, you hear people teaching on prevailing prayer. And when you hear them teaching on prevailing prayer or having a strong, constant uh, prayer, holding on to God, they make it appear as if Jacob was a prayer warrior. I don't think that's what was the case at all. I think what happened was God began to break into the life of Jacob in a way that was the most intensely personal way that Jacob had ever experienced the presence of God. I look at God as being so incredible that it would be impossible for me to wrestle and win. I believe what you see in this case is a clinging to and a frantic desire of not being left behind. Have you ever tried to teach your child to swim? or seen anybody, or maybe you've taught small children to swim. These, these little things are the most powerful. They're little, may, they may be four years old, but they can strangle you in a second. When you put them in the pool, try and get them off your neck. <laughs> it's true. You put a baby in the pool. My, my, when we were trying to teach David to swim at the age of four, he was just a little teeny guy, but I couldn't peel him off my body. I couldn't. I, would, I, I didn't want to hurt him, but I couldn't get him off. And I would sink down lower and lower, and he would actually climb on top of me so that he could have air. And there was no way I could get him off gently, because he clung to me. Why? Because he recognized me as security and safety in a fearful circumstance. I believe that is what is happening to Jacob. 
It's not that Jacob is so powerful and spiritual, and we portray him that way, but he's clinging to God, hanging on to him, knowing that without God, he's a goner. Without the Lord, he cannot prevail. He can't win. This is where God brings you and me to, to the point where we're willing to abandon all our self confidence in our abilities and clinging specifically to him, hanging on and crying out, I need your blessing. I can't make it without you. And I really do believe that the church is so weak in that area today. The church thinks that we can do things on our own strength. And we, we, we cling to those kinds of thoughts. It's humanism disguised in Christian terms. God is a God who blesses you based on your weakness, not on your strength. God is a God who blesses you because you need it, not because you demand it. Jacob was a man who only was blessed because he came to the point of realizing that without the blessing, he was dead. And this is how God blesses. So God reached down and touched him and gave him a permanent reminder of his own weakness in that he shrunk his muscle in his hip. And forever he would have a limp. Forever he would carry a reminder of his encounter with God. I believe that God will give to you and give to me that kind of reminder. Whatever it may be personally to you, it will be with you forever. And you'll carry it. And you'll remember your encounter with God. How that you needed him. And how that God met you where your point of need was. Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming. And with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Rachel and Joseph last because they were the most precious to him. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself on the ground seven times until he came near his brother. That was a sign of respect. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. So all this fear that he had was worthless, and yet it was something God used in his life. They wept. He lifted his eyes and saw the women and children, and he said, Who are these with you? He said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down, and Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, these, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, or I've got plenty. My brother, keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. That word enough that was used in verse 9, Esau said, I have enough, is a Hebrew word mean, meaning I've got, I've got uh, uh, plenty. I've got, I've got enough. I've got plenty. But the word in verse 11 is I've got everything. I've got more than enough. I've got a, an abundance. Why? Because he's got the Lord. And he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau, then Esau said, oh, incidentally, when he took it, that was a sign of his accepting not only the gift, but accepting his brother, too. If he had kept refusing to take the gift, it would have been an indication to Jacob that his brother Esau was not forgiving him. That's why he kept pressing him to take it, because when he took it, it was a sign that he forgave him and all was restored, so he took it. Then Esau said, let us take our journey, let us go, and I'll I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should dry them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me, which livestock that go before me, and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth, which means booths. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aram, which was Mesopotamia, and he pitched his tent before the city. 
and he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, which were Hivites, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected his altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, his new name. He, in other words, he used his new name, his covenant name, which is Prince with God, in this, and he called it the God, the God of Israel. Now, several years have passed by. Now, you remember Dinah, judgment? Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now, they've been there for several years, and she has now developed friendships with the women or the younger girls in that area. She's probably a young teenager at this time. Now, when Shechem, the son of Hamer, the Hivite prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated him. He raped her. And he doesn't appear, you're going to see this interesting, he doesn't appear to think that it had anything, you know, was any big deal. Because he saw, and she was hanging around with the girls that were in his city, he assumed that her values must be the same as the rest of the girls that they were hanging around with. And it was easy for him to have any woman he wanted. And he saw Dinah, and she was appearing different. She dressed differently. She was probably a very pretty little girl. She had a beautiful, uh, not a beautiful, but she probably had a nice looking mother. I'm certain that uh, Leah was not an ugly lady. And so he saw her and he, he liked her. And he said, well, what's the big deal? And so he took her, he lay with her and he raped her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. See, this was a custom that they were involved in there, and she got herself in some trouble. You can't hang around the world without becoming very... Well, you're putting yourself in the position of being violated by the principles of the world when you hang around it. You're just placing yourself in the position of being judged as being just like everybody else. And that's what happened to Dinah. She hung around with these kids, and before you know it, she was treated exactly like any of the, the uh, unbelievers would have been treated. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamer, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamer, the father of Shechem, came out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. Now, here's what's happening. Hamer has come in to bargain. Jacob's really upset. His sons, who are, are young men by now, some of them are, are older teens probably, are angry. They found out that their precious little sister was raped, and they're mad. Some of them probably in their early 20s by now. And they came in, and there's Hamor talking to Jacob about Dinah, treating Dinah as if she's, well, they're going to say, like a harlot, like a piece of merchandise. He's making a deal. Now, Hamer doesn't think anything happened that's any big deal. What's the problem? So what if a young guy, my son, slept with your daughter? It's no big deal. Let's just get him married. But that's not the way the boys think. Hamer spoke with him, saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. And I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer, his father, and spoke deceitfully. Now, this was Simeon and Levi, the second and third son, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will, give our, we will take our daughters and be gone. And their words pleased Hamer and Shechem, Hamer's son. 
So the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let, us, let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. So their motivator was the greed. They thought, well, we can get all their property if we'll allow ourselves to be circumcised. No big deal. <laughs> all who went out to the gate of his city heeded Hamer and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Now, it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain. It appears that the third day was the greatest amount of pain that they could possibly be enduring. On the third day, they were aching the worst. And you can see them just, they don't want to do anything. They're just laying around, just in a lot of intense pain. That two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. They couldn't even move. Now, that would be a horrible thing to happen. I mean, they're already in pain, you know, and then this, and here they come with these swords, and they just, they killed them all. It's a, that was a terrible plan. It was a terrible thing to do to them, but it was a, it was a smart thing. I mean, you know, the, all of them, they couldn't move, they couldn't do anything, they couldn't resist, and they went from house to house, killing them. They killed Hamer and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth. All their little ones and their wives they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Listen, Dad, is what they're saying. Listen. They raped Dinah. Then they had the gall to come into the house and try and make a deal with us for her. You're telling me, this is what they're saying to the dad, you're telling me that I did something wrong in taking vengeance upon them. But I say to you that you're thinking wrongly because you're allowing them to treat your own daughter like she were a whore, actually a prostitute. They're trying to bargain for her. And they said, there's no way that we're going to allow that to take place. These men, because they believed that they had to judge something like that, went out and did it, and they judged them very harshly. And that is a hard judgment as you read it in your scriptures. 